All right, so we're in our second of only two lectures on vapor power cycles. This whole chapter we do not cover. We cover, we cover a part of it and we skip a lot of it, okay? But uh, here is the overview. We were introduced last time to the Carnot vapor power cycle where you had four components and fluid like steam going through those components. Then we talked about the ideal Rankine cycle where the pump really likes liquids, not a two-phase mixture. So that's the Rankine cycle without any superheat. We talked about the uh, important metrics. The important metrics for both of these cycles are the network, which is how many kilojoules of work per kilogram of steam going in the loop. And you want a large W net. You want a large work net out. All right, the next one is thermal efficiency. That would be work net divided by Q in the boiler typically, you want a large thermal efficiency. You want to convert as much of that heat energy into work. And then the back work ratio is the work that needs to go back to drive the pump divided by the work produced by the turbine. You want a small back work ratio. So those are three metrics. If you have irreversibilities, it's going to degrade the performance of the turbine and the pump. We don't really have an irreversibility for the condenser or irreversibility of the boiler. It's just we typically have isotropic efficiency less than 100% due to some irreversibilities in either the turbine or the pump. How do we enhance performance? Well. The reason that we went from the Carnot to the Rankin cycle is, one, you can't really build a Carnot cycle. It's good on paper and it's good in theory. But it's a practical Carnot. That's what the Rankin cycle is. It's a practical Carnot cycle. So some of the effects to improve performance uh, for the Carnot cycle also are true for the Rankin cycle. For example, increasing boiler pressure. If you increase the boiler pressure, you increase the high temperature at which energy heat transfer is coming into the working fluid. Great for Carnot, good for performance, as well as for the Rankine cycle. Decreasing condenser pressure, it reduces the low temperature. So this reduces TL, this increases TH. Both are good for performance. Now, this is where you deviate from the Carnot. Carnot really needs all of that heat brought in at the one temperature, TH. But if you're superheating a fluid we'll talk about today, you're bringing in heat above the saturation temperature for the boiler pressure. It's good for performance, but we're, we're really deviating from the Carnot now. And then reheat, um, sometimes you'll have two turbine stages and you'll take some of that steam back to the boiler and reheat it and then pass it through the second turbine stage. Now, the vapor power cycle with water as a working fluid is the way that a lot of electricity is generated in the United States and throughout the world. If somebody says, I have a coal-fired power plant, how do they actually, what do they do with that coal to make electricity? They burn it to make steam, to turn a shaft to make electricity. How, they say they have a nuclear power plant. We have four of them in the, United, in the, in the state of Texas, about 100 of them in the United States uh, operating uh, today. And uh, they basically have fissioning, controlled nuclear fissioning going on to heat up water, to make steam, pass it through a steam turbine, then a condenser and a pump, and away you go. There's also some other cycles which are similar. The concentrating solar power cycle, and then the geothermal power cycle, uh, or geothermal power. Uh, both of these can use, and often do use, basically a Rankine cycle. You're just heating up water, boiling it, and generating electricity. A lot of things we skip, so please pay attention to what we skip. Don't study the whole chapter. Oh, I think I wanted to show this video here. So this is a, a schematic of a nuclear power plant. Typically, you see the large containment structure, true? 
huge concrete multi-story containment structure. And that's a lot larger than it needs to be, but the engineers have designed that such that in an accident scenario, it can still withstand the pressure increase, and so it's a large volume inside there. Okay, There's, it's not like they need a big headroom. They just need large volume in case of calculated accidents. And then you have the reactor with the control rods controlling the fissioning of fuel, and you have a primary loop that's under high pressure and it dumps the heat in the steam generator where it's transferred to a secondary loop and the secondary loop uh, brings the steam outside of the containment structure typically out almost like a parking lot it's kind of not that 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 uh, how do you say it? exciting when you first look at it you know there's a big chunk of machinery sitting there yeah it's running almost on a parking lot big piece of cement <laughs> steam is piped out to it and that's your steam turbine Typically, they insulate it, and that's it. And, um, or they put it in a tin metal shed or something, not too exciting. And then that turns to electric generators that are hooked up to uh, transformers that pump it out at high voltage to the grid, ship it to the cities. Well, after the steam turbines, it goes to the condenser. The condenser usually bringing in lake water, something like that. We use a lot of lake water in, this, in the state of Texas. Then they condense it, and then it goes through pump, and then that's the secondary loop. So the primary loop has its own pump, secondary loop has its own pump. You want to, things leak, right? So you try to keep it as clean as possible, but you keep the possibility of any fission fragments or any radioactive material coming outside the containment structure very low. That's a nuclear power plant. All right, let's jump back and continue on. So the Carnot vapor power cycle, the four major components, uh, the boiler, steam generator, turbine, condenser, pump. State one is out of the boiler into the turbine, out of the turbine into the condenser, state two, et cetera. Well, let's pick a high pressure. Let's pick the boiler pressure to be 7 MPa and the condenser pressure to be 10 kilopascal. Let's talk a little bit about if I took a, and developed a leak in a pipe in the boiler, right? which way would the fluid go? Would the steam rush out or would air rush in? If I had a little hole developed in a tube in the boiler, which way would the fluid rush? The steam would rush out. Same question. We go to a tube in the condenser. Surrounded, the tube is a bunch of air on the outside. Does the air rush in? Or does the steam rush out if there's a hole developed in a tube in the condenser? Air rushes in. And that always throws students for a loop. Hold it. You mean it's below atmospheric pressure? Yes, it is. Professor, where's the vacuum pump? I've had students pass Thermo 1 and Thermo 2. Senior design project. They, look, they forget about everything they ever learned in Thermo 1, Thermo 2. And there has to be a vacuum pump in a power, power plant like this. Ah, uh, really? Do you see a vacuum pump? Did I introduce a vacuum pump? There's no vacuum pump needed. But you can't have inside the pipes, inside the system, you can't have anything mixed with water. It has to be pure water. You can't have water-air mixture. You got to get the non-condensables out. You got to get the oxygen out, the nitrogen out. You have to have pure H2O. All right. So anyway, when you have that in a sealed system, if you have cold water rushing over the f inside, you know, the condenser to help it condense, um, then that fluid, that's the working fluid, which isn't going back out to the lake. The cooling water goes to and from the lake but it will make the steam at below atmospheric pressure in the condenser. So 10 kilopascal is very reasonable. And it's yes, it is a vacuum. All right, so now let's take a look. We have saturated vapor, saturated liquid, states one, two, three. Notice the two pressures are high. You basically have the turbine and the pump split. This side is the high pressure. One and four have high pressure. 
two and three of low pressure. What are these temperatures? They're the saturation temperature at the high and the saturation temperature at the low. It's saturated liquid, saturated, I'm oh, sorry, saturated vapor, saturated liquid. And you see the two phase mixture qualities about 70% and 33%. And you get the enthalpies. Um, here are the entropies. Those S1 and S2 are the same. It's isentropic expansion through the turbine. And S3 and S4 are the same. It's isentropic compression through the pump. So then you can say, what is the work developed by the turbine? The work developed by the turbine is going to be the H1 minus H2. So this column, get the H's, and then you can calculate the works in the heat transfer. How about Q rejected in the condenser to the cooling water? That's going to be H2 minus H3. Work of the pump. H4 minus H3. All of these are positive quantities. And the Q in the boiler, H1 minus H4. So this is the key information, those enthalpies. You then can calculate Q net. That'll be Q in the boiler minus Q out the condenser. That'll be the net heat transfer into the working fluid in the cycle. And W net will be work out of the turbine minus what goes back to drive the pump. These need to be the same. If not, look for error. Calculate the thermal efficiency. The thermal efficiency is the work net divided by Q in the boiler. It comes to be 42.9%. This is a Carnot vapor power cycle. Isn't it also 1 minus TC over TH? Yes, it is. Good to three digits at least using this shortcut equation. Make sure you add 273.15 to get temperatures in absolute scale, Kelvin. And then the back work ratio is very high, 30%. So I think you have done all of these calculations, and you need to make sure and do them again, and do them again, and make sure you're efficient. We go ahead and plot it. This was a 7 megapascal, came down to the point uh, 10 kilopascal, 0.01 megapascal, then over, and then basically like that. One, two, three, four for the Carnot. We contrast it with the ideal Rankine, where you're going to bring out of the condenser saturated liquid. So that's the big change. State three is now saturated liquid, so that state four is compressed liquid. So um, the same high pressure, low pressure, same temperatures, except for this temperature right here is a skosh above, right? I shouldn't have drawn that like that. This temperature right here is 0.2 degrees C above the, uh, state 3. We talked about that very small temperature increase across the pump. The pump is not to boost the temperature of the working fluid. It's to boost the pressure. All right, and this is saturated liquid. Um, uh, you work hard to get the enthalpies and the same type of equations for the work of the turbine, heat out of the condenser, work of the pump, et cetera. You get the work net for both and the Q net, they match. Deficiency now is 36%, and the back work ratio drops. Why? Because the work to the pump is very, very small compared to what the turbine produces. The work of the pump is right here, only 7.04 kilojoules per kilogram. Now, the way I did it in this software is I actually let S be S. But if you go get the specific volume, this is the way you would do it by hand, learning exams, etc., is you get the specific volume at state 3 and do VDP. And if you do VDP, the work is 7.06. Not exactly the same, but it's a 0.33% difference. To a mechanical engineer, they're the same. Close enough, right? So two ways. If you're using software, if you do it by hand, you have to use the VDP. Notice the V at state four is very, very close to the V at state three. It's essentially incompressible. 
So let's do a quick comparison side by side. The work of the turbine didn't change. The heat out the condenser went up. The work of the pump went down dramatically. Huge reduction. And then the heat in the boiler, it went up. QNET and work debt, actually, they go up. So what about this as a metric? You want a lot of work out for every kilogram going in the cycle. So this is good, isn't it? This is, it's a 43% increase from Carnot to Ideal Rankin. That's good. All right, but the thermal efficiency is going to go down. It, the highest thermal efficiency is with the Carnot. So this is negative 16%. It went down, which is not so good. But you can't build the Carnot. <laughs> you don't have a, the pump that works like that. So this is okay. But look at the, dr dr the drop in the back work ratio. It went from 30% to less than 1%. This is not only good, it's great. It's super. All right? So we'll take a little bit of bad news for some really good news, and we'll build power plants that run like this. Is there a what? No, the work net has the work out of the turbine minus the work needed to drive the pump. So it's the network. That's the adjustment, I think. Now, what is the next enhancement? Well, uh, don't take the steam out at state one just being saturated vapor. Superheat it. Superheat it. So bring it out maybe instead of, what did we say the temperature was? under 300 degrees C, let's heat it up so that it's 440 degrees C. So now what does it come out at? It comes out at superheated. This is 440, 440 degrees C. Higher enthalpy. What happens to the quality after it goes through the turbine? That's shifted a little bit. We can see that on a, on a, uh, on a TS diagram. Let's take a look at a TS diagram. So if we heat it up, we'll go out to 440. Well, I think I have another diagram. Yeah, here. So instead of stopping state one there, we'll continue to heat it up at 7 megapascal till it's 440. Something like right there. So now when you expand it from state one down, you'll find that the quality has improved. The quality is better. It's better. It's more practical. Uh, it's a little hard to understand this, but you want the exit out of the last stage of your steam turbine to be close to 100% steam quality. You say, well, that's not great from an energy perspective. Well, it's great from a holding the equipment together perspective and not having that water droplets uh, act as an uh, erosion mechanism inside the steam turbine. If you have a, uh, from fluid mechanics, you know that if you're taking a fluid stream and bending it, but I have some rocks in it, the rocks kind of want to go straight. Well, I have uh, steam vapor and I have some water droplets. They're high density, high mass density. They want to go straight. They don't turn as easily in the steam, and so they end up hitting metal parts as they're bending and going through the turbine stages. So it's better to have your uh, exit steam at a higher quality even than this is shown. But superheating is good for increasing the exit quality out of your steam turbine. It's also good because you're bringing in more heat at a high temperature. The higher temperature you bring in the heat into the cycle, the better it is for thermal efficiency. So let's continue on and take a look at our numbers here. Um, let me do, I think I have a comparison chart. Here's a summary. So here was the ideal Rankin 
without any superheat. Same 7 megapascal boiler pressure, same 10 kilopascal condenser pressure. If you now superheat it to 440, what happened to the, the work out of the turbine? It was, goes up. That's good. How about the heat that you have to reject in the condenser? Well, that goes up as well. The work of the pump is about the same. The heat that you bring into the boiler is higher. But here's our three metrics that are interesting. The work net, what happened to it? That's a pretty good hefty increase, isn't it? The net work of the cycle is increased by 26%. And then what about the efficiency? It's a slight increase. Well, I shouldn't even say slight. It's a 6% increase from 36 to 38.1% <laughs> increase. That's a pretty good increase. And the back work ratio is a small 20% down. It's still small, but that's good. So this is good. This is good. This is good. You want to superheat your steam coming out of the... The, the boiler before you go into the steam turbine. <coughs> well, there's one other. In, yes, sir. What's the highest temperature you can go? Well, that's the, the Achilles heel, so to speak, to hold the machinery together. And you can take a look at some of the um, um, reported high performance uh, power plants that are coming online now. And to push it over 50 some percent thermal efficiency, they've had to go to exotic materials to withstand the temperatures because that's what you want to do. You want to push everything to high temperature. So it's more of a materials constraint. And I don't recall the numbers. I've seen the articles, read them. I just don't recall the numbers, how high they were able to get it. But if they can increase it by 20, 30, 50 degrees C, that's a big deal and they'll do it. All right. So now let's take a look at another enhancement called reheat. So here you have two <coughs> turbine stages, not just one turbine, two turbine stages. So you'll take the steam out of the steam generator and you'll pass it through the first turbine stage and then take it back to the steam generator for more heat to be added. And then it goes to the second turbine stage, then the condenser and the pump and back again. So what would this look like? Well, we would come out here to the 7 megapascal, maybe 440 degrees. And instead of expanding all the way down to the condenser pressure, maybe we expand down to such that it hits about 1 megapascal or slightly below 1 megapascal. Then we would reheat at 1 megapascal, maybe to the same temperature, 440, and then expand. And you can see how you would have high quality at the exit of steam turbine one, good. High quality at the exit of steam turbine two, which is good. So you don't have water droplets eroding some of the blades in that fast moving steam turbine. So that's reheat. It's also good from a thermal point of view because what is all of this heat that's being brought in is being brought in at relatively high temperature. This heat bringing in here at high temperature was good for performance. Down here, and we don't cover it in Thermo 1, we cover it in Thermo 2, will be feed water heaters because right in here it's very wasteful to bring in heat just to heat up that cold water that's about ready to go into the boiler. You have to heat it up, but you don't want to burn precious coal or other fuels to heat it up. You want to do something different, and it's called a feed water heater strategy. Next class. Next class, okay? But bring in your heat at high temperature, good for performance. Reject your heat. This is where you're rejecting heat out of the work, working fluid. At low temperature, that's good for performance. That's true from the perspective of Carnot. Remember, 1 minus TL over TH. You want a high thermal efficiency, make that low. You want a high thermal efficiency, make that high. All right. All right. Well, let's take a look at some of these numbers for this case. So we'll take 7 megapascal up to 440. That's about right there. 
We'll expand it to a little below 1 megapascal, expand down to 900. I don't have a line at 900, but there's another estimate of it. And bring it back up. There's a little flat spot, and then it comes up to 440. And then when you expand back down, you're there. So what the, the key things to look at would be what is the quality of the steam after the first one? 99.5% very high. Probably could be a little lower. And the quality of the steam right here, 90, what is that, 3.2 percent. A little, maybe a little on the lower side that I like. Maybe I want it closer to 95 percent. As a design engineer, you'd probably say take that intermediate pressure and shift it down a little bit. If you shifted it from 900 uh, kilopascal to 850, this quality would go down at 99.5 would go down a little bit, and the quality of 93 would go up a little bit, wouldn't it? All right. Well, let's take a look at running some numbers. The work out of the first turbine, how much goes into the working fluid in the reheat, the work out of the second turbine, heat rejected out of the working fluid in the condenser, the work in the pump, and the first pass through the boiler. So the work net, 1440. Notice from our previous, without that reheat, it, you're just keep increasing it. it. It's now up 21, almost 22% higher improvement in the work net. Good for performance. What about the thermal efficiency? Slight increase from 38.1 to 38.9. And the back work ratio? Well, it's still small, but it's, it's down a little bit from 0.6% to 0.5%. It went down an additional 17.9%. Uh, so all three of those changes are good when you have reheat. Well, this is what I wanted to cover. The reheat cycle, superheating, uh, how the effect of the decreasing the condenser pressure, increasing the boiler pressure, all those to enhance performance. And we talked about irreversibilities, so we're skipping the rest of this. Last thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was concentrated solar power. This has been kicked around for over 40 years. I don't know if it'll ever take root and really take off. Um, but they built a number of these things out there and are operating them. And uh, I think I have... A, a website here. Let's take a look at this DOE, Department of Energy. In the geothermal, there's a, the same thing here. So you have a production well bringing up high temperature uh, geothermal fluids, but you don't pass that through a turbine, put it through a heat exchanger. Often they will pick a uh, fluid such that it boils at a lower temperature than water. So often they'll call this an organic Rankine cycle, but that just means they're not using water. They're using a fluid that has a little carbon in it and typically uh, maybe a refrigerant like you have in your automobile, like a R134A or 410A or some other refrigerant would be the working fluid in that Rankine cycle. And so then the, the geothermal fluid, once it's condensed, they put it back down in injection well to help promote and stimulate the production well. And then you're drawing energy out of the rock. Um, if you have what they predict is that, that, that most geothermal power plants in the future will be of the binary plant design, meaning two fluids. Let me close, but let me say this. Will I be here Wednesday? No, Emmanuel will be here. Be kind to him, okay? So if you don't want to listen to Emmanuel, please don't come.